The idea is that during this course, we'll be um, replicating a study, another study, uh, and you'll actually be running code from your laptops. For this pur that purpose, we have um, available a real-life database in the common data model format, the uh, Pharmetrics Plus database uh, made available by the IMS uh, company. So we're very happy with that. I do have some bad news in that the server that it's on, I was just trying it. It's a Amazon Redshift server. It's incredibly slow <laughs> today and it's nothing we can do about it. So uh, the code that I send you is the code that we'll be running, but I simplified it so that it actually will complete. I don't know if that's just today. Every time I ran an iBit, it's loud against Redshift. It's a painful experience. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we have one internally in JNG, and I don't know what they did to that, but that's blazingly fast. You can actually scale it up and, and down as much as you want. So. Anyway, um, that's, but before I do that, I want to just give a general introduction to the package, and then we'll go into uh, actually running some R code. So the core method package is part of what we call the methods library. Um, so what you see here is uh, all the packages that comprise the methods library. Where on top are the packages that are really the specific study designs that we're supporting. So here is the core method package that we'll be talking about today. But we also have a very neat self-controlled case series package. Um, a self-controlled code package, ICTEP pro pattern discovery package, and a case control package. Um, and so, in theory, we could organize uh, these sessions on all, all of these. Probably we're not going to do that. Then we have some packages that are basically used by all of these packages. For example, there is a feature extraction package that we already discussed earlier that is used by the code method package to construct the covariates that, for example, go into the propensity model. And we, here we have the Cyclops package, which is uh, the one uh, package uh, Mark is, uh, is, is leading. That is the regression engine that we're using, the very efficient the regression engine that can do the large scale uh, regularized regression that, for example, we're using for propensity models. There's also a database connector and SQL render that are specifically for talking to any database in any, uh, well, a large set of formats and a large set of SQL dialects. So what are some of the technologies that we use inside of this package? Um, so like I said, we use the database connector and SQL render packages to interact with a common data model that can be on any of these platforms. So SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, Amazon Redshift, which is what's we're currently using for this demo, uh, and Microsoft uh, APS. We use the FF package, which, what, which is actually a third party package, um, to handle large data objects. So sometimes, for example, when we um, construct a large um, set of covariates, uh, that can be more data than would fit into memory. And our, one of its weaknesses is that it usually doesn't handle that very well. Um, but FF packages, uh, the FF package um, basically uses your disk as an extension of your memory, and so we don't have any problem uh, running out of memory space. We use Cyclops for, for large-scale regularized regressions. So before I showed you that in the... Why are you even here? <laughs> <laughs> I never get to hear your... Uh, tutorial because I always do the other one at the same time. Oh, okay. So. Oh, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> as long as you, you stay quiet. <laughs> um, it's not going to happen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so before the break, I, I uh, mentioned that in the coward method package, basically we broke up the Graham uh, study uh, replications into five steps getting the necessary data from the database, defining the study population and type at risk, creating a propensity score, doing matching, fitting the outcome model, and throughout uh, generating uh, various diagnostics. That is the general workflow in the cohort method package, except you may choose to not use a propensity model, which generally is not recommended. And instead of matching, you may choose to do trimming or stratification or a combination of trimming with matching and or stratification. So this is the general workflow, um, and in order to demonstrate that, we'll be 
replicating this other paper that you should have all read, I think, uh, which is by uh, E. Garbe, which is why the code that I just sent you is called garbe.r. Um, so this study is comparing um, two NSAIDs, uh, silicoxib versus diclofenac, for the outcome of upper gastrointestinal complications. For this exercise, we've already created, so just sticking to the terminology that we learned before, that means that your T is silicoxib, your C, your comparator, is uh, diclofenac, and your outcome is uh, GI complications. Those three cohorts already exist uh, somewhere on this not-so-fast server that I was just mentioning. So the code will take you from uh, that, um, that state and you will need to move it forward from there. Um, so I actually uh, was ahead of my slide. So we have our TRCRO. The time at risk is simply specified as cohort start to cohort end. And the model specification is that, again, we'll use one-on-one -on -one propensity score matching, uh, but instead of using a Cox regression, as was used in the Graham paper, we're using uh, a conditional Poisson regression um, and a multivariable one at that. All right, so um, the way that we've set this up, uh, and I'm not, well, we'll see how this goes, is you can simply copy-paste <laughs> Uh, pieces of the code and run it yourself um, and probably during that process you will run into question but step one is uh, getting the necessary data from the database and I'll explain what is going on uh, before you actually run the code hopefully you're not running the code yet um, <laughs> so we have our target comparator and outcome cohorts um, that we're going to get uh, from the cohort table and actually had to modify that in the code that you got because it's called uh, a garbage cohort in, the, in that uh, example, but it's a table that had oh sorry Backup there are in general when you use the cohort method package There are several places where we could store this these uh, three cohort option one is in the common data model there is a table called cohort um, that's a general purpose table, um, and in most um, um, situations, that's a table that gets populated by Atlas. So if in Atlas you click on generate cohort, it will do so, instantiate your cohort inside this cohort table inside the CDM. It doesn't work like that at all sites, because not always uh, people have right privileges on the, the CDM uh, uh, schema. We also allow you to get this information or store this information in a table that just has the same structure as the cohort table. Um, and so you could have that in a different schema and you could just point cohort method to that different schema and, that, and you have to specify the table name and get it from there. And that's actually the way that I like to use uh, the cohort method package because I then just instantiate the cohorts that I need for a specific study. I have my study specific um, uh, cohort table and I know that nobody else is going to mess with that and, and uh, uh, secretly change it without me knowing which would be bad <laughs> also if your 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 cohorts are very simple your T or your C your target or comparator you could actually just use the the standard eras that are uh, generated in the uh, drug error table in the, in the um, the common data model. So I hope everybody's familiar enough with the, the common data model that there is a table called drug error and there's also a table called condition error and these contain standard um, um, well, drug errors. So in this case, usually, uh, well, specifically at the ingredient level, it, it creates errors of exposure for people. And so you can also use those to define your, your T, your C, and even your O if you go to the condition error table. And this is supported by the, uh, the package. One thing that the cohort method, method can do for you, and that's an option, is it can limit to the first exposure. It can remove subjects in both cohorts, and it can enforce a washout period, so a, a required amount of continuous observation prior to uh, starting in your cohort. 
if you may remember, before the... Um, Why would you not do that in the Torah If you remember... Good question. <laughs> good question. If you been there. You were going to be quiet. <laughs> if you had been there, before the break, Patrick showed you that he had actually already done that in, um, in Atlas. Um, that is actually the preferred way of working, because then in Atlas already, you know how many people end up in this uh, in your cohort and you can run uh, descriptive analytics on this cohort and that's just more convenient. However, if you're choosing to use, for example, the drug error table because you want to run not just on one drug but on a, a thousand drugs, um, you have the option of doing it uh, while loading the data. But like I said, that's usually you do it when you uh, uh, define your cohort in, in Atlas. All right, so, so that, that's our tier CEO, and then we have the covariate. And I already discussed this a little bit before the break. Um, we usually use the automatically constructed default set, that if you just in covariate, create covariate settings, you basically turn almost everything on true, is what is constructed. Uh, you could create custom-defined covariates. So if there's a covariate that isn't in there, like a very um, novel risk score or something that you want to compute yourself, there is a option to do that. There is a facilities to do that. It would, you should look at the feature extraction package uh, to see how you do that. But that would require you to write actual SQL code and R code um, to implement that particular feature. Um, importantly, if you choose to use, for example, the um, uh, automatically constructed default set, you need to specify uh, at least the drugs of interest uh, to be excluded from covariate construction because it actually includes the index date um, when you construct covariates and that would mean that you have your own treatment as a predictor of your treatment and, and that doesn't work. And you have to do it by hand if the cohort is done in cohort building? Yes. That's actually, no, that's actually a, a good thing that you're reminding me. So if you're using drug era, that means that your, your, your cohort ID for your T and your C will be concepts. And in that case, um, there is an option um, in, in the package that it will automatically know which things to exclude. But of course, if you're using Atlas, then all bets are off. It doesn't, you're getting a concept or a cohort definition ID that doesn't specify what concepts went into that. Um, um, and so you have to uh, specify that yourself. Um, all right, so for that we have the getDB cohort method data object uh, or function, um, and I'm just going to uh, walk over the the arc, go through the arguments that, that uh, this function has. Um, first argument, connection details, specifies how you connect to the database, and in the code I, uh, I uh, sent you, it specifies this connection detail uh, uh, object. Um, it just tells you the name of the server, what type of server it is, in this case Redshift, uh, username and password, you know that's my username and password. Um, you also need to specify um, the location of the common data model, uh, data in common data model format. And so we call that the CDM database schema, um, because what is a database in some, on some platforms is a schema in another platform, so we just contracted to two words to make a <laughs> generic word. Uh, so instead of some, some people being confused, everybody is confused. Um, we, do rec we do make heavy use behind the scenes, you, never, you normally never see that, of temp tables. And um, Oracle doesn't support temp tables, or not really. Um, so in order to simulate temp tables, you have to, if you're on Oracle, you need to specify a schema that you have read and write access to uh, that we will use as a, a pseudo temp uh, table space. But like usually, like in this case, we just set it to null because we don't have to, we're not in Oracle. Um, you need to specify the version of the common data model. We're currently supporting version four and five. Unfortunately, Atlas only supports five, so it's really, <laughs> It's not very, very, uh, very useful feature that we found. And you probably have a space before CDM5 for a CDM database schema. Is that an error? That's a problem. Uh, I do. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a look. 
All right, so those are just the arguments for, for finding the data. Then we have the arguments for finding the exposures. So we have to specify the database schema where the exposure cohorts are, your T and your C cohorts, and that could be the same uh, schema as where your, your CDM is, or, or it could be a different one. Uh, the exposure table is the name of the table that holds your exposure cohorts. So again, so this could be your CDM schema, and the, the name could be cohort, meaning the cohort table in your CDM schema. In this case, it's not because I created a study-specific uh, cohort table. And your target ID is, of course, the cohort definition ID of the target target group, and the comparator ID is your cohort the def cohort definition ID of your comparator group. And then, as I said, you, you have the options to remove first, uh, the, or restrict to the first exposure only, remove duplicate uh, people, and, and specify the washout period. But typically, we do that in, the, uh, in Atlas. All right. Um, also, some arguments for specifying study start date and end date um, that allow you to truncate uh, follow up time. So next we have arguments for finding the outcome. So we have a database schema for that and a table. And again, this could be the, your CDM schema and the name of the table could be the cohort table. Um, and your outcome IDs is one or more, could be many uh, cohort IDs for, uh, for your outcome cohorts. And so in this case, we only have one, uh, the GI complications. But uh, if we were to include a set of negative controls, we might have uh, but maybe 50 or, or more. And it will fetch data for all those outcomes at once. Then we need arguments for creating the covariate. So we have our covariate settings object that you uh, create using the uh, create covariate settings function. Um, like I said, if you're using the drug error table, um, it can automatically figure out what are the covariates to exclude, to not include drugs, the drugs of interest, uh, in that case, you need to set exclude drugs from covariates to true, and it will use this automatic feature. Otherwise, you will have to uh, specify the covariates to exclude in your uh, create covariate settings uh, uh, function call. The result of this function is an object of type cohort method data, and that object uses uh, the FF package to store its data. And that, yep, go ahead. Sorry, uh, yep, sure. Uh, so here you said that automatically exclude drugs of interest only works if the target ID and the comparator ID are concept. So that means that uh, the cohort definition ID has to be the concept ID? No, that means that if you're not using the drug error table, because in that case your, your cohort IDs would be concept IDs, but instead you're using, for example, Atlas, then by, you know, there's no way that, that your core definition ID is going to be a concept ID. You would actually need to specify the concepts uh, to remove elsewhere. So you have the create covariate settings function that has an argument exclude concept IDs, and that, that's where you would need to specify the things to exclude. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're, if you're just writing a manual SQL query using drug error table and calling the, the cohort definition ID as a drug concept ID, then that's right, because then what the cohort method, um, what this function would do for you in the background is would, it would call the, uh, the vocabulary and tell me, give me this concept ID plus all of its descendants, and then it would say, just remove any concept that, that is based on this, uh, these concepts. All right, so I was trying to explain that. This object that's generated uses the FF package to store some of its data because it can be really, really large data. That means that you can't use the standard uh, R functions for storing uh, a data object because it would actually lose the link to uh, any data that's written on file. So we have created a function called uh, save cohort method data specifically for saving this type of object. So sometimes these objects can be like many, many gigabytes uh, large. Uh, it's not a problem, but uh, just so you know, that, that, that can happen. OK, so how can we then produce some diagnostics to make sure that, we, that everything went OK when we did the data fetch? So we have the generic R function summary. 
we can call it on uh, on the core metadata object. Um, and some some things that might be of interest is well, are there at least people in in your target comparator and outcome cohort as you extracted it? So here's the number of people in 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 T, you know, people in C, um, and here are the number of people that have the outcome uh, in in the set of people that are either in T or in C. And if you if the all up is zero, is the is the method gonna squeak and say I can't do anything? If, 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 if the outcome and the and the population don't have an overlap at all? No, so but what not at this point. Okay. At this point it will just say count is zero. Yeah. And you can go ahead and you can fit your propensity score and, and create your study population and whatnot. And then later on it will say if you want to fit a Cox regression or some or an automata, it will say, but I have no outcomes. So at that point it will start to complain. And we'll actually give you a warning when you do a call create st study population, but that's it. Okay. Just a question. So uh, now uh, the treatment concept I used was one, two, three. So if you have generated the cohort Right, you manually set your query instead of atlas, then what would be the treatment concept? Right? There would be like multiple treatment concepts, I guess. Well, so when you call get db cohort method data, you can only call it uh, one target comparator combination at a time. So if you have multiple pairs of targets and comparators, you would ha simply have to call that function multiple times. You can include many outcome cohorts in one call, but just one pair of a T and a C. Or you combine them yourself how, how would you? You just um, merge them. Well, you can create a very elaborate T and a very elaborate, yeah. elaborate C, but still you can only have one, one, one T and one C in one of these get DB cohort method data calls at a time. Does that? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's try this. Uh, so everybody can start running the code. Uh, oh, don't look at this. This is old. Um, all right, sorry about that. Um, ignore all that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, just run the code that I just sent you all the way to where you get the summary on the code metadata object. Wait, is that the website? That can't be the website. No, 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 no. No, that was. Ignore all of, the, all of this. That was the website. That exists like that. Yes. If only you had version it. Worked. <laughs> um. Worked a lot Of course. Sounds like it. Oh. So you sent us code? Yeah, I emailed it. Um, I don't know if you got it. Um, maybe because you joined later than I, I mean. I did, I was the last person. That yeah. Um, nope, did not what I want it. I want to go, oh, it should be here. Where's my email address? Oh, there it is. Forward. Um, no, sorry. Sir, what was your last name again? It's B as in Victor, I E R, and yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do it. It would just be really slow on. You should have your email. On what IMS is providing us. This is B. I expected E bow. Yeah, there it is. Oh, the, um, the, the server that's hosting it oh. just isn't supporting. Yeah, but that, that I'm not. I, I, I know, I know. But, uh, you're, like, you're like, I can't prove the data. Alright, so, so you should have an hour. Yeah. It's just an AWS question. Yeah. Is it just one or is it all? Alright, so is everybody at least attempting to run this? Yeah. 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 Oh, you're already way ahead of where you should be. So do you want to 
want to start from mm -hmm. observing people. Terrible, the, terrible, the terrible. The first day they start observing people. Well, it's only the good people. The next day they start observing people. Yeah. 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 That's the big difference. But the one line doesn't work. So let's say I'm interested in more than you. So this is the next day when you want to observe it. It's going to be small. Those are the ones. But you could have them in here. Oh, you're the first thing. The event for the character book for your treatment or for your outcome. Remember, TC is out. Okay, so we haven't even defined TC yet. So, what's your outcome? What is the outcome? Run in like uh, yeah. about a bit of a mobile version of that. I've never seen it. Should work. I know. I know. We're using old versions because we wanted to replace the old version. Ah, everybody just says they're Java versions. No, I do the. But does it not work on? I think it doesn't work. It's So Mark Tyne, some people didn't know they need to set their temp folder to some. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. There's a temp folder that needs to be pointed to a real location on your hard drive. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I just randomly had it. You have an S drive? I guess. I'm not. Oh, that's what it said to you? That's what it said to you? He had like S colon temp. Oh wow, thank you so much. It's a little bit of an adventure. These are chicken sandwiches. Oh, but I already had a sandwich. Okay, well, we brought you two more, so <laughs> you guys choose to eat them or choose not to eat them. Well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, it's a full on fire. I don't even remember. Who gave me this one? I don't even remember. Okay, but. Okay, you don't have to eat them, but they are food for you guys. Well, you just told me the outcome was something. Okay, and so did. Thank yeah. you. Okay, no problem. Awesome. Oh, oh, careful. The outcome uh -huh. of everyone who has a that change in the use of the That's a note. Because you need to define those things in a generic way. That's not what, you know, and then in going through the instance, you know, you will use the intersection of these people and these people, and you'll use the intersection of these people. But you should confound in your mind the definitions. Mm -hmm. uh, very clear about oh, we who we okay. exposed okay. individuals are mm -hmm. and what the outcome is. Mm -hmm. The only way not to confound it is so, so what do we, we what is this? Um, and then just what what we, we, so the whole right, because right, otherwise you'll start confounding what are we things. Going for? So for the guardian paper, yeah, oh, this is for the guardian paper. Yeah, yeah, we're by the data. Mm -hmm. okay. So you know, your outcome is some transformation. So I think they made it very small for the server. Yeah. 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 That's also why they will see later on. Yeah. Like, yeah. There are only 70 covariates, 17 yeah. covariates, yeah. because I just picked the yeah. demographics. Yeah. <laughs> because anything more right. would just be yeah. 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 <laughs> so IDs on it to the database is cheap. We're super interested. 
how slow it will be on our services. Well, it talks. So what you'll have to do yeah. is you need to take right. these groups yeah. of individuals, yeah. extract them down, yeah. um, yeah. ask yeah. if you really want to study between them, adjust yeah. Yeah. the yeah. 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 So you'll do some sort of matching, and now you'll have a smaller yeah. sort of set yeah. Yeah. between T prime and C prime. Yeah. This first yeah. step is the first step that, that really yeah. touches yeah. the yeah. database. Yeah. Like, like so the it can be a very the intensive uh, step on the server side yeah. because it's structuring all these covariates. And their outcomes for all those individuals, you know, the the length of time and if it, if it happened, will be the intersection of these groups. Mm -hmm. right, so if, if O and T intersect, those are the ones where they had events, mm -hmm. and where they don't intersect, there was no event, and you have a set of three events. Mm -hmm. And so there, yeah, there, there are two good reasons for keeping these ideas separate. One is so you don't have mark on this. One is to say one is to find outcomes. And for efficiency, it makes it much easier to change your outcome. Then, then you don't have to touch anything about your exposure groups. Mm -hmm. In the schema for all the three of them, it's going to be the same. For what the cohort table looks like? Sure, but I've got a cohort table with this an ID, an individual, uh, at, at a time, at least one time. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> yes, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> and then even worse, like the person ID, and a repeat of the concept ID that represents how you pick them. So it's the same value for every No, it's probably just because at least one. I had to two times. Um, reduce the number of covariates in the code that are generated just to get the whole thing reasonably fast in the server. So, no, no, no. So, so, I, think yeah, so, so I think that's the problem. Do you want to study what happens in the things, or is now your outcome a composite? So you want so instead of doing time to first event, maybe you want to estimate the incidence of the Probably if you said n if you now say after that comma n equals ten, super fine. When is the uh near when you actually fit the 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 outcome bottom. What? Yeah. I mean I've never had a situation where I had less than 25 so want to do. <laughs> That's what you want everyone to do. Actually, I want oh, everyone to do oh, conditional yeah. Poisson models. Yeah, so it's the only covariance that we're creating. What kind of optimization function is that? It optimizes work for me. <laughs> no, so. I will try to think of the PX spot this way. Okay. So red is the formatting, yeah. blue is after matching. What, I did what is this is just the ordering mind. of the same covariance. Mm -hmm. um, this is yeah. ordering yeah. them on yeah. the yeah. different yeah. And then after the before way. matching, and this is ordering them so on the different the after matching. matching. Oh, so you use the matching. So the usually when you have like a, a lot, a lot yeah. there are actually yeah. three different yeah. sets of covariance, but in this case it's the same covariance for each different thing. So that's why I was a bit confused. Because the code method is very nice. You weren't supposed to go all the way to the end of the code. That's okay. I did. I'm trying to set up this multiple transformations. Right. So, what was your question? I'm trying to just do. Well, so a couple of things. So, put it all together, and then just try to fit in a very large batch. Yeah. But that's just another piece that got put in. That was there before. Sure. What? That was there before. Yeah, I had it. That's what you did. That's what you did. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's what you did. Yeah. 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 Well, it's good practice. Practice. Yeah, it's, it's what we in output are going to do. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a terribly small. Yeah. Um, okay, you're also okay, I'm interested. Everybody in one pupil. <laughs> okay, that one we make sure they are. I think Neymar and Ty, we get different answers. Is there some randomization thing? That different answers in what? Some 
uh, for the final treatment estimate. Mm. That's what you get if you yeah. you don't get? listen to your, your teacher and run ahead. <laughs> so yeah, you absolutely will. So where are sources... Are you instigating, Mary? So where are sources of randomness here? I assume it's the same people we're picking. I was. So it's going to be picking like about the propensity score. Yeah, so we're the propensity score where we're using cross-validation okay. to estimate regularization. And so that can vary a little bit. Okay. So your propensity scores might vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, you, no, life we, is not deterministic. <laughs> you have to run life once. Yeah. Do you run it? No. no. <laughs> There's no reason to run it more than once. <laughs> the wire, that's the that, would be, that is the old thing. Well, okay. <laughs> is it like an average? average? Uh, so, so the reason average why the reason why it's currently so sensitive in this respect is because it's just too little data. Yeah. Normally we just fix the, fix the seed, but it really doesn't matter as, as much as as, um, as it does right now. Like between two runs, it will actually not change that much if you have way more data. But this is currently. why is there not enough data? Because the Redshift server that is running on it is extremely slow. So you would act to shrink it down. I shrink it down to the absolute minimum. Of uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, next time we need to do it beef better. up. Better. Yeah. Stuff. Third time's always a charm. Yep. All right, because everybody's getting bored, I will uh, plow ahead. Oh, the cookie. Sorry? The cookie show. Yeah, there you go. Um, all right, so, so what do we think of these results? Are these okay? Let's do the diagnostic that I just taught you. There's only 17 covariates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so the number of covariates is a little bit on the low side, but that as I tried to expl explain, is deliberate because the server is extremely slow. So you set it to 17? Yeah. yeah and when you set it, it just picks up 17? No, no, no. So I specified it to only create demographic covariates with this 17. So it is some useful 17. Okay. Yeah, age and gender okay. and things like that. I uniform randomly pick 17 out of 10,000, <laughs> and I hope it helps. I think <laughs> yesterday <laughs> gave a whole long speech that, you know, you shouldn't pick yeah. covariates, and that's stupid. And before lunch as well. Yes. <laughs> Go to the principal's <laughs> office. <laughs> All right. Um, but we have. You should never. He did. He said you never. Should never nice. Good. <laughs> All right. So we do have people in T. We have people in C. Actually, quite a. That's a respectable size. Yeah. And we have people with the outcome. That's actually quite a large number. Hmm. Okay. A lot of people that have CI complications. That's right, yes. Is that right? So, they can so we have a specifier that has to be first only in this one. No, so that's something that comes later, if you may remember. So, for the, the, the outcome... Oh, so, this is just the outcome. So, just outcome. Oh, so okay. Okay. So and not the outcome that we're interested in. Okay, I'm well, getting... Well, that's that's where I'm getting... We're not combined yet, right? These are separate groups. Kind of and you can be in one group. Oh, the other group. Oh, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah but yeah. the point here is that there are more so events than people. Meaning that people, so there are people that have more than one outcome. Right. Where the outcome is, is the GI complication. So when, there are people that have two or more uh, complications at several points in time in their, their history. What happens if you, if you uh, duplicate them? Doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. So, but just to make clear that probably, I don't remember myself, but what Patrick probably did in the Graham replication is already when he was building the outcomes in Atlas, he was saying restrict to the first. Yes, yes, I think that's what he did. And so here we didn't do it, so you could actually have multiple, but then later on if we say remove people with prior outcome, uh -huh. there's actually a reason why we didn't do that here. Yes, we know. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so no, good. Understand. So I'm 
very happy we have some multiple events. Exactly, yeah. Actually, we only have one subject with 6,500. <laughs> 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 oh, 2,000 events and everyone else was one. But. <laughs> All right, next step. Uh, defining the study population. Um, during this step, we select only one of the outcomes in, of interest. In this case, we only have one, but um, we can enforce additional filtering criteria and we can define the risk window, as I also showed before. We use the create study population function for this, and that has several arguments. Uh, for one, the current method data object that you've just uh, extracted. The outcome ID, so the idea of the outcome that you're interested in, and in this case, you actually can leave this argument out because there is only one. It will automatically pick the one that's in there. You have here again, first exposure only, remove duplicate subject and wash out period. Um, so we now have three locations where we can um, basically do this filtering. We can do it in Atlas, we can do it while loading the data, and we can do it at this specific location where we're creating the study population. Why this beautiful duplication? It's simply for efficiency reasons. If I were to do a study where I would want to do a sensitivity analysis where I want to change my washout period, I don't want to create two different cohorts in Atlas maybe, um, and I also don't want to do the data fetch twice so I can um, actually specify it over here. Um, and the same goes for the other, other uh, ver um, uh, filtering steps. Um, so that's really why there are three locations. So sorry, what are you so filtering, first exposure only means if you didn't filter already on just the first exposure when you were creating your T and your C, you can now say just pick the first uh, error that I have per person. Like if you're using the drug error table, every person can have like hundreds of, of, of exposures to the same drug. And here, usually in a new user cover design, you're just interested in the first one. So here you can say restrict to the first one if you didn't do that already before, and uh, remove duplicate subjects. Usually you don't want people that are in, in both cohorts. Um, and wash out period is require at least uh, 365 days, for example. Of things you typically do some sensitivity analysis over. Yeah. Yep, so, so in that case, you might not want to do them in, in Atlas, but you want to do them over here. That could be a, a reason. This remove duplicate subjects, it's gonna it's gonna remove the patients from both T and C or only from T? Or only from both. So if there and if any overlap is completely removed from both T and C. And you got to have to if, if you budget, don't if you don't like it. that behavior, then you need to specify more specifically what you want in Atlas so that those individuals don't show up. Right. So like I said, there are now three options where you can basically remove duplicate people. And in Atlas, you can actually very clearly say, for the target uh, cohort, you don't throw away people. And for the comparative co cohort, you can say, remove people that are in the target cohort. And then you have the behavior that you just uh, where did you do. That's, where did you do that? In the definition of the cohort? In the definition of the cohort in Atlas. Oh, so you just support them from another cohort? Oh, you can just. You just add, add an inclusion criteria that says uh, should have zero occurrences of whatever uh, is the thing that defines the other group. So, uh, this is, this is to say not having both drugs at the same time, is this uh, what's used as the period of time? So this is more restrictive than that. So basically, any person ID that's appearing in, in both of the uh, cohorts is, is oh, thrown out. Like person ID. Yes. Um, so this is an important one. Re remove subject with prior outcomes. Um, but we already discussed Sorry, it. Can I just move back one step? So sure. In that, in that um, example we did this morning, one of the, well, the censoring criteria so they wouldn't be in the situation. But he did. But that, you know, in the actual study, they censored, but they left it in until the... Yeah, until the... So that 
that. They use that as, a, as an exit criteria. So that is, so okay, that could be a difference. I'm not sure how that would work. So another argument is prior outcome look back. So if you say remove people that had the prior the outcome before, you can also specify how many days you're going to be looking back. So usually we just have that at nine 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 nine. So any time before, uh, but it could be that you just say okay, just if they had it in the last thirty days, I want to remove them. Just wait until those forty year studies start happening. <laughs> 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 that that number is going to fight us. <laughs> 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 Three, one, two, ten. How do you set the number? So it's true, true, false. And no, no, no. So, so yeah. So, so this is a true, false, and this is just the number of days. Not in your code, right? I don't. No, no, no. This is just what we're running for the example. These are right, but more correct. arguments. Okay. So, yeah, so there are more so arguments than might be in the code. Default, you, so you didn't list all the arguments. Well, I didn't use all of them in the code. It makes for hard, to, hard to read code. Yeah, but on the other hand, people don't know what all the arguments are. That makes it much easier to know what they yeah. might be setting, might have to set. Because you know this by heart, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you just, yeah, you just do the dot, dot, dot if you don't want to anymore. There are those of us that believe in long signatures <laughs> and those of us that believe in short signatures. Yeah. No, but this is, if this you want to, the problem is, if you don't know by heart what all the stuff is in there, then yeah. this would help you to say, okay, I have to check it all yeah, off. Yeah, all the okay. No, yeah. there are advantages of long yeah. signatures instead yeah. of uh, object classes. <laughs> All right, moving ahead because I don't think we're actually not don't have I that much time. Set at fifteen minutes, and, and it's twenty minutes until fifteen minutes. So we're at like. All right. Uh, okay. All right. So we have our our arguments for defining the uh, the risk window, which basically is the day that it starts, the day that it ends, and then whether or not you want to. Uh, basically add the whole length of whatever was the length of the cohort uh, to that date. So you can also say, if I say add exposure days to start, I could actually have my risk window start, for example, when people stop taking the drug, which doesn't usually happen, but you could even specify that. Usually this is what is false and this one is true um, and the rest are zero. So, so the risk window starts, basically the index date. So let's say the patient took a drug today, so that would be... Risk window start is zero. It's zero, so that would be like today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what about add exposures day to start? Well, so then suppose that my, my cohort ends, which might be, for example, when I stopped taking the drug, is, is, is 30 days from now. That would mean I would add 30 days to my start date, meaning that my risk window wouldn't start until I stopped taking the drug, which maybe doesn't make sense, but in... In some studies, that's what people want to do. But wait, but it, then it's, it's a fixed 30 days, right? You can't say stop. No, 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 no. So depending, if you said add, add exposure days to start, it basically means that your cohort end date or, or your exposure end date is what drives when your risk window oh. starts. And so that can be different for everybody. This could be used as like washout period. Yeah, so sometimes people um, have two studies. One is for what happens when you're on the drug, and one what happens just the period where you stop taking the drug. So, it's just, maybe, so in this area, is, so I've been looking at a problem where I want to look at a rehospitalization. If someone's hospitalized, exits, and then I want to start the clock. Would I be using these? No, well, I wouldn't. Um, probably you would just define your index date, date to be the time when you leave the hospital the first time, and that's when the clock starts ticking. That's how I would probably do it. So the discharge date. Mm -hmm. Calculate that's the right. between each first, each admission date and each discharge date. Uh, move on, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, so just some examples, when, when you just want the risk window to be the time exposed, you said a risk window start to zero, add exposure days to end uh, false, a risk window end to zero, and add exposure days to end true. So that's just basically taking the cohort start and end date as defined in wherever you got the cohort from. Yeah, it's a horrible name, I know. Uh, <laughs> it is. Ba basically, when you set it to false, 
your reference point is what is the cohort start date. When you set it to true, your reference point is whatever is your cohort end date. This is probably a better way of thinking about it. So, so to note, when you say reference point, you mean the end of the list? Well, no. The index list. So reference point in this case for the start, and in this case reference point for the end of the risk window. A picture will help in future. For the next tutorial. Yes, a picture will help. This tutorial is going to picture. What? No, next one is a picture. This one we just have to make do with the text. Yeah, I don't have anything to draw on, I'm afraid. But Are they redundant? Like, is add exposure to the start equals false? You always have to change add exposure to and the true. Both no. You have both the true and both the false. Yes, you can have that. So let me run through through so, some examples, maybe that help. So this is just time exposed. This is how we define it. And then some people have an idea of call, something called intent to treat, which is basically all time following the index date. So in that case, risk window start is zero. Add exposure days to start is false, so that means you're starting on the start of the cohort. Uh, risk window end is a really large number, and if we, I don't know how many years, but maybe you want to add a nine, nine there. Um, um, and add exposure days to end really doesn't matter anymore, because you're just go, always going to go on until the end of observation for that person. So that's how you specify an intent to treat that just starts on the index date and just goes on until you have no more observation time in, for that person. Then we have, for example, time exposed plus 30 days. So you start again on, on the index date, so risk window start is zero, uh, add exposure days to start is false, and then risk window end is 30. Add exposure days to end is true, so that means you you go on to the whatever was defined as the end of your cohort, which if you're using the drug error table is the, the, the time you stopped taking the drug, and then you add 30 days to that um, because you may suspect that the, the effect of the drug will carry on for 30 days after you stopped taking it. When you put this to true, when does the window start, the risk? Then it will start at whatever you define as your cohort end, so if you're using the drug error table, I see. then... It will, all, it will change your start of your risk window to the end of the exposure. Which so really this should be called set start date to start, set or set risk date to start, set risk date to well, end. Well, except that here you also have an offset that you then add to that. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, are they, so they're basically yeah. offsets yeah. Yes. Yeah. the stronger start date, stronger end date, yeah. that you pull from your code. Well, so these are offsets, uh, the start so and end, and this is relative to what is the offset. So if, if this one is uh, true, it's relative to the end date. And if it's false, the start will be relative to the cohort start date. But next time I will have the graph which will help. Mm -hmm. And like, you don't, you never, never really use add exposure days to start. I just had one particular example where I needed it and that's why I added it, but it's certainly something happens. Well, you couldn't you for like procedures and you don't want to pay of the procedure itself, that kind of thing? Well, but then you just add one to yeah. the start. But oh. you never use add, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. add exposure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but moving on. <laughs> or you could say, I just want the first 30 days after index, no matter how long somebody is exposed or not. So then you set risk window start to zero, add exposure days to start false. Risk window end is 30, add exposure days to end. So that's just always the, the 30 days following index, independent of what whatever your cohort end date was. Those usually are the options that we, we use and, and nothing more. So the result of that function is just a data frame. So you can just use any R function that you, you like uh, on that uh, object. Um, but there's one function you might, may find useful. It's called the get attrition table function or else the draw attrition diagram function. And if you call that, it will give you the attrition diagram. This is actually not the one that Mary got, because Mary got a duplicate. Mm -hmm. um, have you already figured out why there are there's two times a, a filtering of people that are in both cohorts? All right, I'm not going to uh, rack your brain on that one. So 
as I was trying to explain, there are multiple places where you can remove people that are in both cohorts. And for some reason in the code, uh, it's set to true in both cases. So it's set to true when loading the data and it's set to true when creating the study population. So it's trying to do it twice, but the second time it actually no longer has people to kick out because they're in both cohorts. So that's why you see it twice. Yeah. So it's actually bad of my example code that I had it there. All right. Um, so I think most of you are actually already way ahead, but please uh, go ahead until you go get to the attrition diagram. And I will quickly, well, you already have it. So here, yeah, you have it in the... Oh, there it also is. Yeah. 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 He would have needed zero days to, to event. Changed one, and that's the, the old one. So this makes good. 
All right. Next step, and for most of you already completed step, um, propensity models. But I'm actually going to explain something here, so you may or may not want to uh, pay attention. So, for propensity models, we all, by default, we use a regularized regression. And I have a feeling that most of you are already familiar with this concept, but I will try and explain it anyway. So, the, the propensity model is just a, a, order, is a logistic regression model where we have, we're trying to build a model for the probability of the treatment, one treatment or the other, the, the T or the C, um, conditional on the covariates that we've constructed. So that usually takes the form of um, an intercept and then uh, betas for every, every variable covariate that we created. All 17. All 17 in this case. Oh, oh. Wow. <laughs> Usually, uh, somewhere between 10 and 100,000. In this case, 17. Um, the thing that we do differently in a regularized regression is that we specify a, a prior distribution on these betas there. Um, so we, we specify a belief that we have for what the values uh, uh, should be. Um, and we have two options that are uh, supported in, in, in our package. Uh, one is a normal prior, uh, which basically expresses the belief that most of these betas will be small. And we have a Laplace prior that basically expresses the belief that most of them are small and actually most of them will be exactly equal to zero. So we prefer the Laplace prior because actually what the end result is that most of the betas will be exactly equal to zero and we can consider them to be have fallen out of the model and we no longer need to consider them. What is the right width of that prior distribution? Well, that's very hard to tell. Um, if we make it too wide, then we'll get convergence problems because then if we have uh, correlated features, we, we will have trouble picking one or the other uh, and we probably end up overfitting um, uh, our model. If it's too narrow, then we'll get underfitting, meaning that we might uh, miss uh, important predictors in our model. The default setting in uh, the current method package is to select this hyperparameter through tenfold cross-validation and aiming to optimize the out-of-sample likelihood. And that actually, we found out, works pretty well for this problem. So it's now a fully automated fire and forget approach that you just call the create PS function and it will, will do all of this for you in the background. So the create ps function has the arguments to create the, the covariate metadata object, of course, because that holds all the covariates. Uh, the population, the study population that you've now created, because it has to restrict to that population. Um, there is an ob object called prior, an argument called prior that specifies the prior that you want to use. And so by default, it's on Laplace. And actually, I forgot to mention that you can also set it to normal. You can also set it to none, meaning that there is no prior is used and it actually becomes an ordinary logistic regression. And so in this case, because we only have 17 uh, covariates, it will just work fine if you set it to none. Um, 
If you're feeling uh, clairvoyant, you could specify the variants that you want to use for the um, <laughs> for the re regression. In, in, in the initial OMOP experiment, we thought we were clairvoyant. It turned out we were off by over an order of magnitude. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or if not, you can specify to use cross validation, yes or no. And you can specify uh, covariates to exclude from regularization. By default, the one that ex is excluded is the intercept, for hopefully obvious reasons. Um, next to that is a control object that. Um, basically controls the, well, mostly co controls a lot of things, but basically well, controls the regularization or at least the, uh, the cross-validation. You can specify like things like the tolerance, so the, the precision that you want when, uh, when you're optimizing the likelihood function, and the number of folds in the cross-validation. CV repetitions is there is a sampling going on when you create the folds, and you may end up with a very unlucky sampling. Um, and so if you want to be absolutely sure that you're really estimating your, your, the performance of a particular hyperparameter value, you want to have multiple repetitions of your cross-validation. So you can actually say, I want 10 cross-validations, uh, cross validation, and I want to do that 10 times, for example. That's something we sometimes do when we really want to be sure that we're fitting a good model. And not unimportantly, you can specify the number of threads used during the cross-validation. Um, you can imagine and if you're doing 10-fold cross-validation with 10 uh, repetitions and you're doing that on a very large data set, then this can become a very uh, computationally heavy exercise. Um, you can spread it out over, the, over cores, um, but uh, it only works on the cross-validation. So if you have 10 folds, then basically the maximum number that makes sense for threats is 10 because it's not going to use any more. Uh, than, than that. No, it works, it works over the replications. Too. Oh, it works also over the replication. Okay, but, so. But any computer hardware, the bandwidth is going to give you speed up. Yeah, so we've actually been playing around with that. And at a certain point, of course, the more cores you use, it doesn't mean that you're actually yeah. becoming faster because you're starting to hit other bottlenecks such as uh, memory access and stuff like that. So I usually keep it somewhere between 20 and 30. <laughs> so if we don't put it, I'd say that it just what does it do then? So if you don't specify, it uses one. Oh, well. Yeah, so that's not usually what you want. So do keep in mind, if you start working with larger data sets, this becomes your friend, because it means it's... It, why would you not give it some, some heuristic between false and repetitions? Well, uh, like. so we... Um, like number of false time, number of repetitions kind of stuff? Oh, I can figure out. The real reason because we're lazy. Okay. Um, you know, arguments against. You don't want to assume that this is going to be the only task running on the system. And so the user has that knowledge, and so the user should provide that. But the user doesn't have knowledge what actually happens in, uh, under the uh, under the hood, and so no. therefore they have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it in the function? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's all there. Okay. It is in the help. So, but like. We don't want to set it to like. I mean, there are certain this is your machine. machine here, so you should do whatever you want. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Good. <laughs> All right, so this, this function returns, again, a data frame. Uh, it's actually the same data frame as that went inside, into it, uh, but it will have an extra column that contains the propensity score. Ten hours later, one extra column. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's not. It's, it's more a function of... Can you go one back? I can. Population. Okay, that's why you have one column. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the result is basically this object that went in, but just adding a column. Yes. Is it Cyclops running under the hood that's doing? Exactly. Okay. All right, so. Diagnostics for this step. Well, so first step is um, we've actually built in a feature that is an extremely useful feature. Um, that is 
this function will stop very soon, very quickly, if it finds that one of the covariates is almost perfectly predictive of treatment. Because that usually, well, almost always is an indication that you misspecified your model. So you probably forgot to exclude uh, the drugs from your covariate set. Um, so the first diagnostic is that you actually were able to complete the function without hitting this error. Um, the next step is you compute the AUC of this model, but there is a bit of a problem there in that we don't really have a recommendation of what you should see. Because if the AUC is 0.5, that could be for two reasons. One is we have a really bad model and we're just not able to predict. Or you have a really good model, but the populations are completely comparable. So one is really bad, one is really good, and then we have no recommendation. We do know that if the AUC is one, um, well, again, that could have two reasons. One is maybe you still had some very predictive things that that first check didn't find, or your populations are really completely different. Um, so it's people always talk about the AUC of a, a propensity score, but I'm not, I'm not really sure how to what to do with it. What to do with it. All right, so an, one that is very useful is the function get PS model. What that will do is it will uh, give you back the model that was actually fitted. And as I just explained, when you use the Laplace prior, or in the case when you only have 17 <laughs> covariates to begin with, that model should be something you can inspect. So at most, a few hundred covariates. Uh, and it will rank order it by the, the, the magnitude of the beta. And so you can see which are the variables that are most predictive of treatment. And there, you might find some things that are not the things that you want. Of course. So if you have 100,000, then what you're saying is all of them are going to be just have a small effect? The ones, even the biggest yeah. ones, are going to be all small to small points? Well, so if you, have, if you start with 100,000 covariates yeah. and you use your, uh, your regularized regression, then yeah. maybe 200 will have a non-zero uh, coefficient. And you only have to look at those 200. And you rank order them by betas anyway. And so the, so probably the first... So the first 10 are the ones that are most most informative. Okay. Yeah, how do we do that on the, what we've just done? Can we, so you say get PS on the I think that's actually, that should be in the code. Yeah. Yes. The as propensity model was the top one. Is, is, uh, are the variables normalized so that the magnitude of the coefficient is a true representation of its importance? That is a very insightful question. Yes, the variables are normalized before fitting the model. That means that you. They're comparable. That means that they're actually comparable. And so the beta is more or less the importance of each variable. All right. And the one that I per personally like most is run plot PS to generate the actual uh, distributions. And, and so the previous ones. This is what most studies look like. <laughs> but nobody reports it. Yes. Uh, so this is good. You have large overlap. They're comparable. This is bad because they're really different, the two populations. I mean, Graham just got really lucky. Yes. <laughs> so, so this one here, the previous one? So if there's an, one where you're saying, what the hell? Or what, what are we doing there? So something where you're saying, I would have never expected that. So. Well, so sometimes there are things there that you wouldn't want. So what if a, the, the prescribing of a drug is dependent on the physician doing a particular test, a procedure, and the procedure ends up in the model? Then you can argue that that particular covariate just should not be in, in your model yes, fitting. Because it's a, it's a de facto substitute for the... It's, yeah, it's, it's actually part of, you could say it's part of the, the exposure itself. Basically, all you're doing Yep, okay. Which is why you can't automate that stuff at all. Yep. We should figure out how we automate that. So we're at 217. Yep, I know. Let's go. Um, all right. Um, you need to try it yourself. This, The reason why this plot looks really crappy is because this is a 17 few, yeah, uh, covariates. I'm sorry about that. I really wish we had a more powerful server because. All the code that you're, you're now using would also run with 100,000 covariates, but not fast enough. Um, so how, if we wanted to run it on all covariates, is there like a, a, a 
No, no, no. So the create vari the create covariate settings function is the thing that specifies which covariate gets constructed. And so currently, if you look in your example code, the create covariate settings function only has um, create um, uh, demographics uh, covariates to true and then age. So is the comment without that, that's what we should run So that one, what that will get you is the covariates used in the garbage paper. Um, if you want to run everything, um, or you can call up the help function of the create covariate uh, settings function, and that will give you everything that you can turn to true. What I would recommend is there are two switches that are called create interaction with year and create interaction with month. I would recommend you don't turn those to true uh, because those are more experimental features. They should work, but... Also, it's like, uh, when, it was done, the when it was done, is that when, when we are in, in overtime with the uh, explorer index day? So as a covariate? No, so it will create all interactions between every variable, the interaction term with the, with the calendar year oh. and with the calendar month. There are a lot of those months. Yeah. So, there are like 12 of them. And yeah. double, how many did he put in? <laughs> Not that many. Those are the uh, And we don't consider it or, you know, nominal. Also, if probably a very good resource to mention is if you go to GitHub and you go to the cohort method package uh, repository and you scroll down a little bit, there is something called a vignette. There actually are two of them. And a vignette, um, the vignette also takes you through, uh, so it's, a vignette is basically an R document that describes step by step how you use a package. And in this case, it will also show you exactly how to run a study. In this case, actually very similar to this study. Um, but there it is the code for generating all covariates. So, I have a question. So demographic month, that's the observation month? That's right. And demographic That's on index date. So that's the index date when of your T or of your or your C. So oh, so if you're in T, then it's the index date in T, and if you're in C, it's the index date in C. And all right, moving on. Um, well, I'm just going to assume you'll be running this code anyway. I'm going to plow ahead. Um, Blah, blah, blah. All right, matching stratification trimming. Um, so once we have our propensity score, we can match, stratify, or trim. Um, and we have functions for each of that. So what matching does is for every person in the target group, you pick one uh, or more people in the target group. Stratification is, means you simply stratify based on the propensity score, and it will automatically create strata uh, that are equally sized, the number of people. How many? You can set the number, of, the number of strata. It's an argument. And trimming is you can choose to actually eliminate people on, on uh, each side of the extremes. If you don't do a comparator, but you're saying give me match from non, from anybody or from non-treated, so it's a whole lot. Is it the same? You just make the chords that way. Yeah. Okay. So the comparator but, then is everybody. It's yeah. A gigantic thing. Yeah, but it's not recommended. Because? So, because that's not, that's not really a comparable group. You're usually comparing yeah, compared to the guys who didn't uh, get treated, but they are exactly the same because you match them perfectly well in the. No, it doesn't work like that. Matching. We've actually you tried that. Well, we we replicated somebody else's study where they did that, and that just ends really badly. So you get bad, uh, bad blue and red uh, mountains. Yep. And even if you then afterwards match and and manage yeah. to get your covariate balance in order. When using the uh, negative controls, you see that you're still extremely biased. You should, you should never compare to a non-user population, is my general recommendation. That's what the Schneebers used to say. Did he also say that? Oh, yeah, he's, he's yeah. Like oh, well, curious. Well, no, he's, he's right. He's a, he's a clever guy, you know. So. But did you say never compare to a non-user? That's right. So there are people. What if you, what if you match? Well, so so we've we've 
replicated somebody else's study at one point where they had actually done that. And so first of all, you see that the propensity score distributions are really far apart. Then even if you do matching and you see that your covariate balance tells you that you're getting balanced, we then used negative controls uh, and saw that even after matching, you still have an incredible amount of bias. So it's just not, not something you generally should do. Because there, really there are differences that you can just not um, adjust yourself out of anymore uh, using, using propensity score matching. I think the primary reason has to do that it's not so much that it's different people, because that's the thing that you can correct for with a propensity score. It's also the time in their lives. Because the day when you start taking a drug for you is a very special day. And, and the time following that is also special in that you're, you're in the system and you're seeing your doctor and whatnot. Whereas if you just pick a non-user population, then what is your index date? Do you just pick a random day out of their calendar? Well, then usually on that date, nothing is happening. And the, the weeks after that, also nothing. So if you can pick a... But if you compare to like a non... Random some random drug. Oh. Not so then you have a comparator. So, better than so in this, the, this replication study that we did, what we did to fix it was exactly that. So we said, okay, you have to at least start on a drug. And we also made some other um, additional inclusion criteria to make them already more comparable. And then actually you saw that the bias uh, went away. Yeah. So. The interpretation of that though, you know, because the whole idea of the propensity score is to say, okay, you're, these two people Yeah, so I definitely agree. You're on very thin ice when you start do, making comparisons like that. And so yeah. the, the negative controls can give you some assurance on that it's it's still a right comparison. But even in that case, yeah, you're right. So I, I would, when you've got to, you know, you, try, you can get comparisons, but is it really what you want? Yeah. Is it really the question that you want to answer, I think? You can do it. And they look the same, but, yeah. Oh, and also... Generalizability, I think. Exactly, yeah. You well, just demand that every doctor prescribes a whole ton of random placebos so that our databases contain those <laughs> for comparison. No. All right, I'm going to very, go very quickly um, through these functions. So we have functions for matching, and um, so things like caliper and the caliper scale and the max ratio. Um, we also have a function that allows you to match on the propensity score and something else. So. Some people, for some reason, do this. I, they say, I want to first match on age, and then within every age category, then I want to match on a propensity score. There, the functions actually allow for that. But, you know, so I don't they, 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 some of the covariates are more equal than others? Exactly, yes. Okay. Uh, stratify, well, not surprising. It has an argument for number of strata. Um, sorry, going very quickly here. Um, there are two types of trimming. Trimming by propensity score that you just uh, trim a certain percentage and trim by to equipoise that's something that alec walker proposed uh, that you first uh, transform your propensity score to a preference score and then you say everything that has a preference score lower than 0.3 or greater than 0.7 i will throw away and that's extremely restrictive but you are making your populations very comparable okay. what's the it's a transformation of your propensity score to account for the, the ratio in size between the two cohorts. All right, um, but anyway. So diagnostics for this particular step, for the matching, the trimming, and the uh, stratification. So again, uh, so you can use the attrition table and, and draw attrition diagram functions to see whether you uh, still have any people left. <laughs> Because if, of course, the two groups are very, uh, very different, and you say, I want to do trimming, then, well, if you trim to equipoise, then you just lost everybody. Um, most, more importantly, probably, is you can use the uh, compute covariate balance to uh, compute the covariate balance before and after matching or trimming or stratification. Um, 
And that usually should look something like this, but I think you already um, already explained that before the, the break. It's much better. Look at that. Yeah. Perfect. So all all 17 covariates <laughs> oh, squished down. are, are got whacked. perfectly <laughs> in balance after matching. So that's proof that our method works. Uh, sorry. I'm going to actually skip ahead even more because we have three minutes left. Um, last step is fitting the outcome model where we we have a couple of options here that I, well, Patrick already explained the different models like, so you can choose between logistic, Poisson, or a, a Cox model. Um, importantly, important feature is you can choose whether or not you want to condition on the strata. So a condition analysis basically performs the analysis within each strata and then um, um, accumulates the result across, across the strata. That's one way of thinking about it. If you're doing stratification, then you have to do conditioning on the strata or else your stratification has no effect. There are people that um, perform matching and then don't uh, condition on the match sets. Uh, and there are people that do, and that's like, a, I don't know, a, a, re a religious uh, debate that, that I'm not going to uh, take a side in. Um, you can also choose whether or not you want to include covariates in the outcome model. So you may or may not already have adjusted using a propensity score, but you can also then include even more uh, covariates into your outcome model. And so one option is to use, just use all the covariates that you used in your propensity model and also include them in your outcome model if you so wish. If you do that, what will happen by default is that there will be regularization on all of these other covariates, but not on the treatment variable. Um, because the treatment variable is the one that you want an unbiased estimate of and you want to compute confidence intervals and that's not something that you can easily do when you use regularization on that variable. Um, so all of these are not very surprising. So again, we see our prior object and our control object because there is an option to do regularization here. So I've explained these, um, these arguments already before. So diagnostic, well, um, you could run the plot Kaplan-Meier function. One thing to keep in mind there, and actually uh, the core method package will throw you a warning. Um, if you have strata in your data, a Kaplan-Meier plot has no way of dealing with strata. So it will show you the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier plot without any consideration of the strata. That means that if your strata is somehow removing bias, that stratification, that, that adjustment is not visible in the Kaplan-Meier plot. So that's something to definitely keep in the back of your mind. That's something I still need to think about because I think that's a solvable problem, but we currently haven't solved that. I mean, if the number of strata are small, then you have separate Kaplan-Meier yeah, You could have, yeah, small number of strata, you could have Kaplan-Meier plot per strata. Right, you know, but if it's a match set, maybe not. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was trying to look at the residuals from the match set. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is the current state. All right, I think people already did that, and actually this is no longer what you should get because we switched to something else. Um. All right, so just wrapping up. Um, in general, the study steps are getting all the data from the database, defining the study population, may or may not want to choose a, a fit a propensity model, you may or may not want to trim, match, or stratify, and the last step is fitting the outcome model um, and throughout your generating diagnostics. There is a part of the core method package that we use a lot, but I haven't touched on at all during this uh, tutorial because that's the, the advanced, advanced tutorial. There is something that we call the all by all support that basically allows you to specify a large set of drug or target comparator outcome uh, triplets, a large set of analysis setting, where an analysis setting is, is something like the, uh, the choice of whether you want to do matching or stratification, your risk window definition, etc. So these are all considered analysis setting. And you can throw these two buckets of choices into the package, and it will find the most efficient way to compute its way through all possible combinations of, of uh, target comparative outcome triplets and analysis settings. And it will um, 
used like multi-threading and whatnot to, to get as fa fast as possible to a large set of estimates and diagnostics for uh, all of the questions that you threw at it. And um, one reason why you might want such functionality is, well, sensitivity analysis, so you can specify a large set of um, uh, analysis to run through. Um, maybe you want to include negative controls, so you can have multiple um, uh, drug comparator outcomes, or multiple outcomes in this case. Uh, I use it for methods research, if you want to try a, a whole bunch of different uh, scenarios. Or you might even want to consider something like safety surveillance, where you're just running through a large set of, of questions and want to see, well, or even oh, even comparisons. comparisons um, yeah. Like, results that I presented yesterday are run through this, uh, this, yeah. um, this approach. For, yeah. And then you create this 30,000 plots and you go through them one by one. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, of course, something also I didn't, well, I mentioned it already several times, we do very strongly recommend negative controls as a study diagnostic. So we add diagnostic throughout the process, but we consider the final <laughs> diagnostic to be at least including negative controls. And, um, well, negative controls are outcomes uh, not believed to be caused by either exposure and, and so we want to observe the distribution of estimates when we run our entire analysis uh, on a, a set of negative controls. And so usually you get something like a plot like this, where every blue dot represents the uh, relative risk and, and standard error for a, one of these negative controls. And you would like it to look like this, that only 5% of your um, negative controls are below the dashed line, meaning statistically significant. But the method, the... the package doesn't do this. This is something you have to do by hand afterwards, right? Yeah, so that's not inside of the cohort method package, although things like building these neat plots is in another package called empirical calibration, uh, which is also part of the, uh, the methods library. But running the negative controls is in Well, so the... Yeah, the you, you would run all 50 plus your own analysis within cohort Yeah, yeah but then... You have to plot this, and then you have to scratch your head. So there's nothing which doesn't take the pay, which you know, in okay. Yeah, it's just another load library, scratch head. Yeah, no, it's yeah. this there. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you guys do all these automations, you never know. So just very, very quickly, because we're actually out of time. Um, what did the, 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 the folks in the other track learn? Well, they learned how to use um, Atlas to create cohorts. So. I guess you're all now feeling sorry that you didn't go there. Um, <laughs> or vice versa. Or vice versa. Um, so they'll now be able to do that, hopefully. Um, they also learned to think a little bit more about study design, and so whether or not you want to use matching or, or uh, stratification. Um, and they learned how to use Atlas to generate starting R codes. So I think Patrick already showed this feature where you can click through Atlas and it will generate a set of R code that basically already performs a, a, uh, a study using the code method package. Although usually you will find that that needs it's just a, your starting point. It's the page with us for all the, um, for all the parameters and then, and then code. Yeah, the nice. It's still, it still needs some love. You can't just uh, assume copy-paste. What was it mean? You can't just assume copy-paste. Oh, so it's love? Yeah, some, some, some attention, some finesse. No, that's not. <laughs> what? What's love mean to you? I don't, I don't know. This is a foreign concept to me. What is the R code? What's All right. Thanks, everyone. What's the code mean?